Welcome to Willis Ways In, where we discuss controversial and newsworthy tax planning topics. I'm Ben Willis, contributing editor with Tax Notes. Today, I am thrilled to be talking with Tony Nitty. Tony is a partner in charge of a national tax and Reuben Brown's tax services group. His Forbes tax column, The Nitty Gritty, has hundreds of thousands of followers. His other publications are too long to list, but you can check out his profile on rubenbrown.com. Now, we are here today to talk about something that's pretty awesome. See, Tony just started a new column here at Tax Notes. Each month, he'll be diving into one of Tax's most interesting cases, uh, specifically with respect to the federal income tax. In his first installment, titled Glenshaw Glass and Defining Income, he studies a seminal Supreme Court case we'll get into soon. With that said, Tony, thank you so much for joining me today. Ben, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I am a big fan of what you're doing here on Willis Ways In, and obviously you're working on tax notes, so it's a lot of fun just for me to hop on and geek out with you a little bit talking about some tax law. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate that. I'm also a fan of yours, your your practical approach. I know you and I have chatted offline for a bit, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm glad we're finishing the conversation here today and, and hopefully continuing in it. So uh, now that you're here at Tax Notes, um, inquiring minds want to know, why tax notes and why this come? Uh, tax notes just felt like the natural landing spot for what we we're going to do here. I'll get into that a little bit more after I guess I explain why, you know, this series, you know, why I go through, as you said, the, these cases month by month. And there's a couple of reasons. I mean, first, as you mentioned, these aren't just any cases. These are the cases, right? Like these are the cases that have shaped our modern tax law that have served as the building blocks for everything that we do. And so I think that alone warrants um, some degree of attention. Uh, from, you know, for a second point, I teach at, you know, as you do, you know, I teach at a couple of graduate tax programs, uh, University of Denver, Golden Gate University, and I teach a lot through the case law. And what, you know, never ceases to amaze me is I can take the students through a concept and we'll try to go through the code and regs And it just doesn't click. There's always just kind of a a struggle there sometimes. And it's not until we find a representative case, right, where we find a set of facts that kind of uh, is similar to what we're dealing with. And they can go through the process that case law lays out by looking at those facts, the IRS argument, the taxpayer argument, and then the court obviously going not just through the law, but even sometimes the history of the law, that it just always seems to click for the students. And it just makes sense. And I just, well, you know, if my students are learning about the fundamentals of the tax law best through case law. Why wouldn't readers learn the fundamentals of the tax law best through the case law? And so I thought that would be an interesting way because as you and I talked about, you know, earlier, what I appreciate so much about your writing is you really take it from an approach of, Hey, I want to write things that tell people something they didn't know before. So they walk away with an understanding that they didn't come into my article with. And it's the same thing here, right? I want to uh, offer up these cases and say, you know, we may have been doing these things, applying these cases without ever knowing they exist, without knowing the citation, but um, why don't we take a look at it, dissect it, and hopefully really explain uh, not just the how, but the why we've been doing things the way we're doing. And I think that leads to the third reason I'm doing this, and it's really simple. People enjoy it. I didn't know people enjoyed it, but people enjoy it. What I mean by that is um, a couple of years ago, Damian Martin over at BKD, you know, he asked me to join his Simply Tax podcast at the end of the year to go through what I had been doing in written form, the top 10 court cases of the year. And I just thought, who is possibly going to listen to me drone on for two hours about 10 different court cases? But hey, do you think it's worth a shot? Let's do it. And uh, really surprised, I think, both he and I, how much interest, interest there was. But what you realize is hey, not everybody has the time or the money or the ability to get a a master's in tax or a law degree with an LLM, but everybody wants to understand why. They want to know why they're doing what they're doing. Nobody wants to just kind of go through the careers implementing the hows. They want to understand why. And so this is a chance to take a little bit of that why at its most basic fundamental building block level and try to explain it in in, in a way that hopefully people learn from and then enjoy Thank you for that. That's a very helpful insight. And it also helps explain 
the difference between this this column that you're doing now and what I think you're you're most famous for. And one of the reasons why I'm such a fan is that you're really able to provide practical insights that people can apply every day in their life, uh, whether it's brand new bills that are just coming out and uh, uh, gaps and uncertainties that you help fill for folks. Um, and, and people appreciate that. And so when I, when I saw this, this column, which is really, you know, going back to these, uh, historical cases and your, and your first one with Glenshaw glasses, I, I, a fantastic article that really succinctly gets to the point of its importance. And so what you're able to do is, is answer that question of why, why is this important in our listeners and our, our tax practitioners lives and, and people who, who want to learn. Um, and so I think you're, you're, you're bringing that uh, together well. So I'm, I'm really excited. What about this specific uh, article that you've, you've just done, Glenshaw Glass and Realization? Uh, why, why select that one first and, and, and bring it to our attention? That's a great question. And Ben, something tells me guys like you and I, we could spend hours debating who's worthy of that first article, right? If you're going to talk about the seminal cases in income tax history, I don't know. I think it was more or less an open shut case. Glenshaw. I mean, it, it gets to the root of what we do. It's an income tax, right? We got an income tax. We probably need to know what is income. And obviously there's just never going to come a moment in time where, you know, we close the code and rag at night and go, okay, we figured it all out. We know everything that is and isn't income. And so we need some guiding principles. And there might have been some other contenders for the first spot. You know what a big fan I am of, of Crane, um, but we didn't have to wait long for Crane. But of course, there's some other cases that people could argue. But I just think, hey, we all need sometimes to have, and I think this is where the, the graduate school setting comes in. We may not memorize Code Section 61. We may not memorize the text of the 16th Amendment. And I probably shouldn't say may not for either of those, right? We're not going to. We're not going to do that. So we need guiding principles. Uh, what is income? And Glenshaw gives us guiding principles. I mean, it, it basically reminds us of, of what I tell, again, my grad school students all the time. If you have a clear accession of wealth that has been realized and over which you have control. So the way I put it in layman's terms, you go to bed at night, you know, tangibly richer uh, than when you woke up in terms of gain that's been clearly realized, then you're probably paying tax on it unless you can find something in the code that says you're not. And so I thought we should start there just because what is more fundamental to an income tax than the definition of income? I, I think it's a great selection you picked. And I, and I agree with you. It, it is hard to, uh, to think through all these cases and what's most important, but um, you're going to, with federal income tax. And we're, like you said, we're talking about income here. And so um, is there anything that's inside of the article that you think uh, folks should, should, really keep in mind when they're thinking about income and, and, and uh, what, when to take it into account and, uh, and what might trigger it or what might not. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'd love your opinion on some of this too. But what I find interesting about Glenshaw is not even just so much, you know, where we go from the day Glenshaw was decided in 1955 on, where really the big takeaway isn't all the more complicated than what we've already discussed, right? If you have a clear accession of wealth that's been realized. So we have this realization requirement in the law um, and you have control over it. You, know, you have taxable income. You can apply that to everything from cryptocurrency to, to crowdfunding to, you know, I think um, one of the more famous cases for sports fan, you know, Paul Horning won the use of a, a Ford Thunderbird when he was the MVP of the NFC, uh, NFL championship before it became the Super Bowl. And, you know, they applied Glenshaw to, to say that that was taxable income. You know, when you have these accessions to wealth, it's taxable income. Uh, we see Glenshaw quoted all the time with those three basic principles. What I think is interesting in that article, and this is kind of what I'd like some of your thoughts on too, is what came before Glenshaw? You know what, what, I mean, Glenshaw was 1955. That's not that long ago. And it's 40 years into the tax law's history. How did it take us 40 years to get a, a solid definition of income? And it's really the history to me that's fascinating. And I think we may see some of that history, maybe even pre um, the imposition of income tax suddenly become relevant again when we start talking about Elizabeth Warren's proposal for a wealth tax. But it's the history. It's the history that, you know, going back to pre-1913, the country had tried income taxes at certain points in time, but the Constitution up to that point 
basically, you know, said you can't have a direct tax. A direct tax has to be apportioned among the states based on population. Obviously, that makes no sense from an income tax perspective. And so time after time, we just found that these income taxes were getting uh, knocked away. And then uh, after that kind of last shot where we had that Pollock versus Farmers Loan and Trust Company, where they said this tax on rental income was a basically direct tax on property. And so it violates the constitution. They said, all right, the heck with it. Then we're going to amend the constitution. We got the 16th amendment and it says we can tax income directly. We don't have to apportion it, apportion it among the states. And so the definition of income in the constitution was unbelievably broad, uh, you know, basically saying Congress can tax income from whatever source derived. And so we wouldn't have really, I think, had Glenshaw be this seminal case in 1955, if not for in 1920, the Eisner v. McComber case that we talk about in the article, right? Because Eisner comes in and takes this broad language in the constitution and suddenly, I mean, it's the right decision. I think you agree it's the right decision, right? It was a, a stock dividend and stock dividends don't really leave anybody uh, richer in, in any type of sense that you're just kind of spreading around value that already exists. But the, the law at that time, the, st the statute said that stock dividends were taxable. And, um, you know, they come in and they say, not only that, hey, this is wrong, stock dividends aren't taxable. And this is kind of what gave rise to that realization requirement. But the problem is they defined income so narrowly. They said it's gained from, you know, from capital or, or labor or both combined. They didn't need to do that, but it created like this 30 year problem because every taxpayer who had some type of accession of wealth that wasn't attributable to capital or profits, something like a legal windfall, for example, right? Or even an old colony trust when you know an employer paid the taxes of an employee, they said, um, hey, this isn't an Eisner v. McComber definition, so we don't have income. It just caused this 35 year problem before Glenshaw had to come back and have the Supreme Court once again say, let's just kind of get back to our roots here. Right, Congress, their taxing power was meant to be extremely broad. And so let's just go with these three fundamental principles like we talked about. An accession of wealth clearly realized over which you have control. It doesn't have to be just attributable to capital or profit. So if you have a legal windfall like they did in, in Glenshaw, we're gonna tax it. But you know what I think makes it so fascinating that history is we're gonna start, I think, as a community to talk about things like direct taxes and the 16th Amendment and that sort of thing again, as you know, we have this move forward potentially for Elizabeth Warren's wealth tax proposal. And uh, you know, I'm, uh, you tell me, you know, what did you find in, in the history there to Glenshaw Glass? Like, what do you think is the thing that's most likely to kind of pop back up into the the tax industry conversation as we go forward. I mean, do you think this wealth tax is going to pick up some steam? Do you think we'll be talking about constitutionality of a wealth tax? I mean, what are your thoughts? Absolutely, I do. Uh, I mean, you just spat it off so much right there that I could uh, <laughs> dive into it. I'm going to try because <laughs> I can't help it. That's what, that's what we do, right? Um, but yeah, the, the, the wealth tax that you're talking about, obviously, I've been thinking about tax reform lately. I've been writing about tax reform. Uh, I've been thinking about labor and capital. I've been thinking about the disparities there that our tax code has, uh, which is, you know, designed to incentivize or, or eliminate the certain effects that might prevent investment. But ultimately, we go back and we look at these historical definitions that you bring out and in, in Glenshaw Glass and in Eisner v. McCumber, you know, and, and Glenshaw Glass to, to the point of the article or one of the key points is um, it, it really wasn't labor or, or capital. It, it was this windfall that you point out so well and say, hey, there were these penalties here that were assessed and it, you, they don't clearly fit into one of these categories, but that's what Glenshaw Glass did. It, it gave us some clarity and said, hey, we have an accession of wealth. And so we've got income and it's, you know, broader than we would otherwise think. But how broad can that be? And uh, it's, it's not so broad that a stock dividend, which is clearly capital, 
based. It's coming from stock in a corporation. That's not income. We know that from Eisner v. McCumber, now in code sections 305. Uh, but we, now we're, we're, we're going to think about, well, what, what might be income that's not so clear with respect to Elizabeth Warren's uh, ultra-millionaire wealth tax and, and some of the other proposals, widens mark-to-market tax on, on, on derivatives and certain financial instruments. And when are these realization events going to kick in? And I, I, I'd argue that we've, we've passed that line years ago, uh, most recently with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and, and the uh, repatriation tax, the transition tax. I mean, we switched to a, a, a quasi-territorial system, but really it was only for corporate taxpayers who benefit from this territorial DRD, yet individuals and others were required to pick up the tax. So I would say we've already gone beyond you know, the, the traditional realization concept where legal entitlements are changing. And it just goes to how far are you willing to go or whether or not maybe we're going to step back and realize there needs to be a clear line in the sand where we, we, we got to follow Glenshaw Glass. So that's interesting. I mean, I think one of the areas I didn't do enough of in my article is I, I think maybe looking back on it, I kind of made it sound like Eisner v. McComber, you know, because the Supreme Court came back in Glenshaw Glass and changed the definition. Of it. it's, it's just kind of a, a, you know, a historical footnote, but it's what gave us the realization requirement. I mean, that's really where it came from, where they said, hey, the stock dividend, you're not getting something that's severable from the underlying capital. And I probably should have, like you said, drawn the par parallel to modern day where we are talking about things like, you know, a mark to market system for high income taxpayers, which would, we'll start hearing about Eisner v. McCover again, v. McCover again, right? It's just going to come up in the conversation because as you just pointed out, we're testing, we're testing the limits of what constitutes income or what violates the realization requirement uh, as we find new and innovative ways to generate tax revenue, you know, from a specific sect of the population. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And I think that's what's causing some of these issues to pop up when these with these historic cases is that we've got a real need for revenue. And in the states right now, they're, they're scratching for it, where they're looking at uh, advertising taxes, digital service taxes, um, and, uh, and wealth taxes. And so now we're looking at it at a federal level, but it's already, it's already started at the state level who, who yeah. are the folks who are, I think are hurting more and, and, uh, can't print their own currency the way we can. So, you know, whatever our thoughts may be on, you know, the viability, practicability of the wealth tax, I think we can both say from a, you know, a tax group perspective, man, I'd love to see those, um, debates take place. You know, I'd love to dive into 1800s case law to figure out what does this wealth tax fit under? You know, does it fit under the 16th Amendment? Is it, is it a direct tax? And I just love dredging up those old conversations because it's really fascinating the role, obviously, but the role taxes just played in the very fundamental formation of this country and its government. So um, even just having the conversation start up about wealth tax again kind of, you know, gets the blood flowing a little bit. Yeah. What well, one odd uh, benefit of that tax would would be its its help in transfer pricing. Um, oddly, you'd have this massive uh, appraisal going on across the world of all of all these assets that people own. And uh, you'd start having comparables for items that people argue there are they can't find comparables for. And so in a weird way, it would create this matrix that would allow for, you know, to continuously get easier. Although I got to I got to say that that first implementation period, that's going to be a, a bit of a nightmare on the, a lot, a lot of new uh, appraisals coming in. That's for sure. Um, that, yeah. I mean, like I said, the administrative side, who knows how that gets dealt with, but I, I'd rather deal with the, the, um, the theory side for now. I'm with you. I'm with you on that. So I, I got to bring up this uh, second article in your series. Um, I, I know it actually hasn't come out yet, but we're recording now and it's coming out soon. You and I have talked about it and it's, it's about crane and, and debt. And, and I'd love for you to, if you, if you wouldn't mind just, you know, teeing it up for us and, and, and giving some thoughts. Yeah. I mean, Glenshaw, I think was deserving of the number one spot, but I got to say, I think, you know, when you take it all into consideration, Crane's probably my favorite case that I'll end up writing about in this entire series. I mean, you just think about what that case gave us and what it continues to give us. And it's just hard to top as far as significance. And what a, you know, pedestrian set of facts, basically, right? A, a husband dies, a wife inherits a, a building and land. 
and it's got a mortgage exactly equal to the property. And we know under our current law, when somebody dies, you inherit property under modern day section 1014, you take a fair market value basis in the property. So that's what she did, starts depreciating it. Um, but the mortgage was non-recourse. You know, she ends up selling it for a couple thousand bucks. And she argues that she had zero basis in the property because when 1014 or, you know, the predecessor to 1014, I think it was 114, when it gives you uh, this fair market value basis in property, it's, she said that property was synonymous with net equity, right? So um, the, the value less the debt. So she said she had zero basis in the property, which is just a fancy way of saying there's no basis in property if you have this non-recourse mortgage that goes along with it. And then on the amount realized part, she sold it for a couple thousand bucks, but the buyer assumed the mortgage and she argued, well, I wasn't responsible for that mortgage. It was non-recourse, right? And non-recourse just means that um, the lender can't come after me if I don't pay. And so I wasn't really relieved of anything. And so I have $2,500 again. And you know, the court said, it's not how this whole thing works. And so what's so fascinating about the case is, you know, we learn two seminal things in the case and neither of those are probably the most important outcome in the case, right? So we learned that if you acquire property with non-recourse debt, you get basis in that, right? And we, we apply that every day. And that's what I meant in my intro, that sometimes we apply these cases all the time without knowing that this is where it came from. But you buy property with non-recourse debt. And you and I talked, you have some states where you buy a principal residence. It doesn't matter how the state or how the lender writes up the mortgage. If it's an anti-deficiency state, it's a non-recourse debt, right? And so it doesn't matter. It's not like you have no basis in your home. You get basis in your home for that. And that comes from Crane. But then if you have a $500,000 non-recourse debt on a property and a buyer assumes it, Crane tells us, we don't care that it's non-recourse. You've still been relieved of an obligation to pay a liability. You've still been enriched, right? In the sense that you don't have to pay someone back 500 grand. So it's part of your sales price. So those are two fundamental things right there that we apply all the time. Somebody assumes a non-recourse debt is part of the sale part of your sales price, but it was also part of your basis. But what's so amazing about the long lasting, you know, implications of Crane was the footnote, right? And in our line of work, we know the footnote, but footnote 37, but, you know, most famous footnote in, in probably tax case history, I think without question said, well, you know, yes, non-recourse debt is part of your sales price when a buyer assumes it, but if the property is worth less, then that non-recourse debt, eh, then it may be a different issue and we may be limiting the amount realized to the fair market value. And the reason that was so important, I, I think it's fair to say, I mean, I wasn't around obviously during this time, but I think that's what set the stage for the tax shelter era because, you know, right away, we saw taxpayers look at Crane and look at footnote 37 and say, wait a minute, I get basis. If I buy property for a million dollars that I'm not personally at risk I still get a million dollar basis, but footnote 37 is kind of saying if that property value goes down to 600,000 and I walk away from the debt, my amount realized, my sales price is limited to that $600,000. I could buy that property. I could depreciate it. I could take interest expense on the loan. And if things go bad, I just wash my hands of the situation, walk away and rely on footnote 37 to limit my sales price to the now lower fair market value. And, you know, you're, I'm sure you're, familiar with cases like, like Mayerson and Franklin, where people really tested those limits to see, you know, what could be included in basis. And sometimes they were successful, sometimes they weren't, but you could see how that would lend itself to the, the tax shelter error, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, I think there's, there's been a, a whole litany of, of provisions and rules that have come out after this uh, seminal case, Crane, and um, that have taken advantage of that famous footnote 37 and, uh, and really tried to minimize how much benefit you could get from something that you have no risk, no skin in the game with respect to. And so, uh, you know, starting off with those uh, passive activity rules and those, uh, those risk limitations and um, I think they they were designed to prevent some of those shelters that that you key up in this uh, article um, and, uh, and 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 point out and those cases Franklin uh, you know where they tried to put a stop to some of the you know benefits and in, and in my opinion actually made some overreaching statements as far as what constitutes debt and what is a legal enforceable obligation or or is this really in substance an option 
and um and so uh it's uh it's certainly a, a very interesting area and uh you know i i, I don't know if uh, if if we know what extent those uh tax shelters have fully stopped but uh as far as i know those those rules have some some uh some gaps uh but at the risk of, of geeking out i know you and i love this stuff but franklin right i mean if anyone wants to read a case that just kind of walks through what certainly could look and smell like a tax shelter. You had a bunch of limited partners, right, form a partnership and go out and buy a property with non-recourse debt that they were, the debt was well in excess of, I mean, they never bothered to value the property, but the property had just sold a couple months earlier for like 600,000 and they bought it for 1.2. And then they immediately leased it back to the seller and, um, they lease it back to the seller and they had the rent payments exactly equal to the, you know, the principal and interest. So they didn't even cut checks to each other. They just made journal entries and the IRS basically came in, like you said, they said, you know, there's no substance to this. This is just an option. You didn't even bother to value this thing. And uh, the court agreed and basically said, in this situation, we won't give you, uh, we won't treat this as, as non-recourse debt. But it sounds like you had some kind of thoughts on that debt or at least how it should be treated in excess of, of the fair market value, or did, is that what you were getting at with Franklin? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it comes down to what is true debt and whether or not you need to make this debt equity determination. And isn't one of the factors determining what the ability of that taxpayer can pay and therefore shouldn't the amount come into play and, 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 and be uh, factored in? And, uh, and so it's, it's just, it's a little bit of a slippery slope when you make this economic substance argument and you're looking at this non-recourse feature of the debt to say, well, you know, the debt equity rules are a little fuzzy here with respect to non-recourse, at least in this one situation where the benefit is so great. But uh, perhaps uh, if there was some uh, income that could arise, whether it be from cancellation of debt or, or, or the like, that it, it might not be so favorable for the taxpayer, or maybe not. I mean, it, it depends um, on the facts and circumstances, as, as I think you know well. Yeah, that's interesting. The other thing I love about Crane is I love to use it when I teach, you know, um, to explain to people that answers, and we kind of saw this, right, between Eisen, Rudin, Comer, and Glenshaw West, they don't happen overnight in the tax law. You know, it, it was 1980s when Tufts comes along and address footnote 37 and say, hey, we don't care. We don't care if the fair market value has gone well below the balance of the non-recourse debt. If someone takes that property and assumes a non-recourse debt, the full amount of that debt has to be included in your amount realized. So as you said, you take Tufts, add it to 465 at risk rules, 469 passive activity rules, it goes a long way towards shutting down, down tax shelters. But as you pointed out to me when we first talked, um, you know, saying that, that Tufts and 465 and 469 killed tax shelters is obviously a misnomer because there will always be tax shelters. We've just maybe moved it now more towards 752 applications and non-recourse debt in the partnership world, but you're never going to kill uh, tax shelters. So just for the uh, the listeners, you know, Ben and I, I, we were talking about my draft article before it went out, and I think in the title I had the rise and fall of, or no, the fall of tax, I can't remember if it was rise and fall or just fall of tax shelters, and Ben rightly reminded me, eh, tax shelters, they're still around, right? They're just not the same as they used to be necessarily, but they're still around, there's still ways to have non-recourse liabilities that give you basis uh, in excess of the amount that ultimately comes home to roost, it's just a lot tougher after Tufts and 465 and 469. No, we had, we had some good, you're making me think of some of the value added to uh, an article I've been working on, on uh, related to debt and, and springing debt and, and some of these uh, issues. And, and, and you helped remind me of, of Tufts and, and Crane and, and some of these obligations and, uh, and really helped there. So uh, the, 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 the camaraderie through uh, shared value and, and enhancing these write-ups has been uh, really appreciated. Uh, Tony, I, I can't uh, thank you enough for um, sharing your, your insights with me. Well, the same for me. I mean, everything of yours that I read, I walk away learning a lot from, and I think, you know, ultimately that's what you're shooting for. That's what everybody that's writing about the tax law hopefully is shooting for. Right? You want to add some, some value in that sense. So I enjoy it. I'm glad to hear, um, 
you're gaining something out of the this process I'm going through with tax notes. I love doing it on tax notes. I like I, I never finished that thought earlier, but I think it's the perfect home for this kind of content, you know, where people really are interested in the whys and, and don't mind reading about hundred year old case law. I mean, we're better than tax notes for that. Yeah, no, I think you're hundred percent right. And uh, going back to Glenshaw Glass, where we started from, um, you, you've got some of the most difficult issues, you know, in cryptocurrency, for example. Uh, I mean, think about the wealth tax applied there, and and how we're going to look at those assets, and what assets are we looking at? Are they? It's just there's so much uncertainty there, and so um, I know you and I could could talk about this for for a really long time, but. Um, uh, and I'm, 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 I think I might uh, uh, try to take advantage of that now that you have a tax notes, uh, <laughs> at, le at least on, on a part time basis. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so. Well, the cool thing I think about you and I realize is there's a lot of fun places to go from here, right? There's no shortage of cool cases. And, you know, we're not, I'm not going to limit this to Supreme Court cases. And some of the, I think, more important cases I teach from were not Supreme Court decisions, right? But, um, I'm already thinking about, you know, three or four months down the road and, and where to go next. And obviously I'll solicit input from people like you for that because I, I love talking about that stuff. But you can't go wrong. You know, if you keep writing things that, that people are learning from, then who cares what order it comes in or uh, whatever it may be, as long as people are walking away from something you write with hopefully a little bit better understanding of why the tax law works the way it does. Ultimately, that's kind of all I'm shooting for. And if they uh, enjoy it all the better. Yeah. Well, I know they're going to enjoy it because uh, our readers love to learn and you're a fantastic teacher and you're able to, you know, break things down in an incredible way. And so um, I'm looking forward to reading your work and I know, I know our, our, our readers are as well. Well, I really appreciate that, Ben. It means a lot. Absolutely. All right, Tony. Well, uh, I'm going to thank you for joining us today and uh, and let our listeners know that they can not only find you on Forbes and, uh, and a bunch of other places and other uh, uh, other stuff, but uh, they uh, now can listen to this podcast and hopefully more down the road uh, and, and find out more insights for you. So thanks. Thanks so much for joining me, Tony. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Ben. I think one day we should come back and talk nothing but writing about the tax law, why we do what we do, what we try to gain from it, our different approaches. Uh, I think that'd be a lot of fun. So awesome. All right. Well, for those of you watching and listening to us, thank you so much for joining Tony and I today. You can find my articles, blog posts, videos, and Tony's as well now on uh, taxnotes.com. Please do not hesitate to reach out with any questions or comments. You can email me, email me at ben.willis at taxanalyst.org, or you can find me on Twitter at Willis Wazen. Thanks. Willis Wazen.